Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Lecture 3 Video Games. Woo! So this is again one of those demystification lectures in which the goal is to explain to you how things work. And many of you, how many of you, just as a sense, play video games and love them and want to know how they work? Look at this. The whole room is raising their hand. That's awesome. That's 250 people saying, go video games. So uh, really wasn't that, but I, I'll round it, I rounded it up. I rounded it up. It was rounding from 100 to 250. Okay. So um, how about novel interaction techniques? I always do a computer technology in the news. You now have a, a Wii remote, which lets you kind of move and be with bow and arrow and some other stuff, and it knows where it is in three-dimensional space. If you have this for the PlayStation 3, you have other devices that let you do kind of cool interactive things. How about controlling your video games with thought? The emotive system is a commercial system, and you can watch the videos on there, uh, online in which a player puts the headset on, it reads the brain waves, translates those to a pre map set of actions. So it memorizes your brain with, it says, okay, think, move to the right. And so my, I close my eyes or I open my eyes and I think, move to the right. I don't move it. I, I, I just think, move to the right. I'm thinking, move to the right. And I do that like 10 times. And then think, move to the left. And memorize, remembers those 10 things. Okay, think, move forward. Think, move back. Think, you know, action or fire or whatever. And then when you're playing the game, you want to go to the right, and so you go, okay, move to the right, and you don't move your body, but you think, and it says, okay, of the five things you've recorded, which one is that new signal closest to? Oh, it's closest to move to the right. Guess what? Automatically, you're thinking, it records brain waves, it matches in a signal processing way with all the five brain wave models it has from the thrive things, things you've done before, the average of all of those, and it moves to the right, and you didn't move your body. Then you move to the left in your brain, and your character moves to the left. It is like science fiction, and it works, and it's incredible. So we're excited, possibly, for getting a copy of one of these things for CS10. I think that would rock. That would rock my world if I was, if I were able to control my slides by saying next, and it just worked. <laughs> so I'll put my hands behind my back. Next, ah, very good. <laughs> so in today's lecture, talking about video games, we're going to give you a history with some overview. It's good to know the history. People don't. So, seldom reflect on the history of where they, what got them to where they are. We'll look at the design uh, of, of video games, 2D and 3D graphics, motion capture, AI. We've seen motion capture before. I'll show us some more of that. We'll talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now that you've built a video game, what is, what is some analysis of it? The future of video games, and then I have a guest speaker who is Glenn, our head TA, who actually was a video game designer. And we'll talk about his experience in the industry. So I want to make sure to give him enough time. That often is one of the favorite lectures of the class. So we'll jump right in. So as a background, there's a lot of wonderful movies about video games and documentaries of the history. I particularly want to recommend the Play Value series. Remarkably entertaining, 10 to 15 minute videos. We're going to add that as recommended videos to watch on the web page. So you can just click on the web page. It's a YouTube channel. Just watch all the videos. They're really fascinating and they really capture the history of how we got to where we are. It's really, really fun um, and well done. So the first video game, really, that caught on. There was a video game before that which was kind of a pongy thing. This, or tennis, this is the first video game that really caught on. This is called Space War. And we, Luke and I were showing this before class. Here's a video. Um, both of these ships have gravity that pulls them into the center, and they shoot at each other, and they can go into hyperspace. And in fact, it made a very popular translation to the Atari Space War and other variants on shooting each other in space. The kind of science fiction with video games was very real. The people doing it and building the games uh, were people who were just in science fiction, who were researchers at MIT. So that is a picture of Stephen Russell, and he was one of the key authors of this. And in fact, what's so cool is they took the original code, wrote an emulator for the machine it ran on, a working PDP, and uh, there is actually a working PDP machine in the Computer History Museum, which is CHM. There's a Java version available running on an emulation that you can actually play, which means you can actually play the actual game, bit for bit, that they invented in 1961. So it's so cool. Um, and inspired a lot of folks. And this really is the first time that people played games. But it wasn't games in the traditional sense. It was a game on a machine that only universities had. These really high-end machines, which was a PDP-1 at the time, was not something that everybody had access to. So it was a very limited set of people who were playing this, but it was widely distributed around. So they passed it all around to each other. Uh, other people who had PDP-1s, they passed it around. And so basically the whole world of 
engineers and researchers had this game and were playing it. It was very, very popular, and as I said, widely ported to many different systems. More in the history of two names. One of the things that I do in this class is ask you an exam. Do you remember the name of some people? And I usually do it in kind of a match thing. Here's some names, and here's what they did, and match them. So it's kind of easy. I don't ever just throw a name and say who they do. But when I have a name of a person, you want to remember that name. So Stephen Russell's the first name you've seen so far. Um, these are two people you want to know. These are people who, at least in the US market, which was where video games actually started, really were founding fathers. Ralph Baer and Nolan Bushnell, both entrepreneurs. Ralph Baer had Odyssey, and Nolan Bushnell was famous for Atari. Nolan Bushnell lives about an hour from here, folks. So all this was happening in Silicon Valley, which is really exciting. So Ralph Baer here is receiving the Congressional Medal of Honor from President Bush. Nolan Bushnell, his Atari company, if you look at the history, had much more commercial success than the, Magna, than the Odyssey, but the Odyssey came out first. So you've got to give them both props for that. Odyssey for its initial machine, and then the Atari on how to do it right, and how to translate the video game arcade experience with Pong, as the first game is a picture of Nolan Bushnell with his Pong game. And there's a story of the first Pong game, which they put it in one of the Silicon Valley, like Santa Clara pizza parlors. And then they sat down and ate pizza and watched what happened. Imagine this, right? If you're the inventor of this and you get to kind of just watch as your invention gets used by pizza people eating pizza, drinking beer, like, what is this? Put a quarter in. Wait, oh my gosh. And they, they didn't stop playing it. And they, wait, they went home and they came back and the guy complained. He said, what's wrong? Does it break? No, it's filled up with quarters and we have to get you to empty it more frequently than once a day. Like, like it was more success than they'd ever imagined. They said, ah, oh, maybe $10. It was making hundreds of dollars a day. It was incredible. So that was the first machine in, the, in, a, in a, a setting that wasn't a video game arcade. It was in a pool. I think it was in a pizza heart. And the Atari video game system was one of the first console systems that became very popular. On the back set of your slides, you'll see a whole set. Um, the last set of slides I'm not going to talk about is a more history of the consoles, but I just let you read about that if you're curious about that. Here's an artist you really need to know about. Shigeru Miyamoto. How many of you know about Shigeru Miyamoto? Yes, good stuff. I'm glad that you guys are well read in that. This is the chief game designer at Nintendo and responsible for almost every big video game for about a 20 year period. If you look at the list of games that he invented and was principal designer for, it's the most creative work possibly by one person. You know, he really is in the video game industry, the Walt Disney with the vision to have worlds to explore and technology to explore. And he's exploring 3D and 64-bit games. An incredible, an incredible artist. Really, really a visionary in the field. Very famous. And we thank him for all of the enjoyment we've had playing those games that you see on the list. Now let me tell you about design of a casual video game. One of the most popular is Angry Birds, so let's talk about that. There are two worlds. There's a core video game world and there's a casual video game world. In the casual space, it's really what you're probably used to now because many of you have smartphones and many of you are playing probably more casual games than core games nowadays. The casual games are the games you play on your commute to work. They're not the games that you sit down with your fancy high-def screen and your PS3 and your Xbox 360 and all that stuff and play, and you're paying $60 a game. These are games you pay a dollar, two dollars, even free. It has fundamentally changed the market for games. It has undercut. People are saying, how are we going to be charging $60 for a big Xbox 360 game when you get a really good immersive experience with an iPad and a full screen with a headphone and the whole feeling of it? So there's a, and, and a $9 game or a $6 game. How are we charging $60 for the same rough game? So many people have had to reduce the price that they charge for these games, and that cuts into their business model. Right now, the iPhone and the iPad and the iOS dominates the field, although the Android folks are coming back with having some really fun games and really good stuff here. But for the most part, the big gamers who are in this field are building it for all platforms, for all the tablets and all the, all the, all the personal, all the phones and the smartphones. The time to completion is only a couple of months. That's what's so encouraging. From the point of view of, of students, point of view of you listening to this lecture, there is no more exciting space than the casual video game. You come through this class, Beauty and Joy of Computing. You then graduate, take a couple of classes in maybe graphic design, maybe partner with some folks in graphic design, maybe take a couple more classes in algorithms and mobile development, and you're making a game that's making money. So the potential to take you from where you are now, just beginning to learn about computing, to able to be making money on something, 
Only with the release of the casual video game has that been possible. Normally, you have to finish four years of, graduate, of undergraduate, then you go and get a job, and after four years, you can probably start making some real money. Maybe you have an internship in the middle. But I'm talking about real money if you just have yourself and a couple of other developers. It doesn't take a lot of people to make a really successful game if you have a great idea and some good artistry and good gameplay. Right? It really can be interesting. So think about that if you're at all entrepreneurial in nature, about thinking about the space of doing game design. It's really an exciting space. It's crowded. The field is very crowded, but it's an exciting space if you like games and you like to think of that. Right? With, I never had that opportunity. When I was coming up, you had to be involved with a big company to do this. Now you and three other friends can actually make a company and make some money. It's pretty exciting. You can pay for tuition and all that stuff. So, Core video games are the other side of the coin. They are the heavyweight. You know, this spectrum, the lightweight is a small app that caught, written by one person that was free. On the high, the heavy side of it is the core video game, which is the traditional console based game. You're going to be paying $50, $60 when it's new. You're going to expect to have immersive high definition graphics. You're going to expect to have the gameplay and the quality, the production value, as I talk about in movie terms, the production value of 60, it better be worth your $60, right? That better be incredible. So that involves a 100-person team. That involves a team of artists doing animation and modeling and game design and, and level design. That involves a lot of work for marketers, a lot of work engaging with, you know, the places, the distribution networks, the PlayStation Online and the, the GameStop stores. It involves a big team of folks. It involves $10 million budgets which is a really big deal, which means there are not a lot of those. There are not a lot of these big houses. You might have a couple of those folks in a crowded market for, in this particular case, the SOCOM franchise, the, you know, the combat market. And it's a really crowded market for not a lot of money. The goal is, by the way, to make that up. So you hope to win back at least 10 million to at least pay your bills, but in the best case, you're hoping to get 20, 30, 40, 50 million. That's the numbers I've been hearing from my friends who, who work in this space, is it's a $10 million expenditure with the hope to reap at the top end 50 million. Pretty big deal. The interesting piece of this is Lucasfilm, who, people who are creating content, people who are making movies like Sony Pictures and Lucas and George Lucas with ILM, they are looking to combine their assets. If you're doing motion capture for Lord of the Rings and you want to have a Lord of the Rings video game, why can't you be using all those assets? A new word, right? The assets. That means kind of the collection of images and motion libraries and textures and all the things I talked about in the 3D graphics lecture. Can you reuse those for your video game? So they're talking about that and there are always papers in SIGGRAPH, the National Conference in Graphics, about how to do that, how to reuse assets and how to not have to redo the whole thing when you're working on your video game after your movie stuff. Pretty good, exciting stuff. All right. So, how do video games work? So, let's now do some demystification and leave enough time for Glenn to talk about how, what's life like as a video game designer. So, this really is very similar, and I'm so pleased that I get to tail, uh, tailgate off of my lecture on 3D graphics because that's almost exactly the same. I was talking a lot about, in that lecture, about how to do. Um, Pixar level where you get hours per frame and this is a really key thing is you now remember as you're a video game person whatever you do you only have a 30th of a second to do all the computation for that frame which is all the AI calculation of what your what the creatures should do it's all the reflectance models of where the light should fall it's all the geometry transformations for how the things creatures should move there's hundreds of thousands of polygons that are changing as you're punching me in this video game this is Fight Night 3, my friend, my one of my best friends worked on this and told me all the things that he did and all the, he worked in for DreamWorks making movies and they hired him to take all the movie effects and put them in the video games. And he said, well, that's really hard because I used to have hours per frame to generate realistic skin and realistic sweat on the skin. They said, no, no, you have now one one thousandth the time to do the same thing. What can you give me in one one thousandth the time? And look at that. There's glistening of sweat on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the fighter. And as they fight more, there's more sweat. And it beads and it rolls down. As you punch, you can see there's like a blood. I mean, it's a little disgusting. But it's a little bit of a, a fluid flowing, a fluid simulation with that. It looks like it's incredible what they're able to do. What with the hacks. It's really a hack. Just as long as it works, as long as it looks good, we don't care how it's done. It's literally as hard-coded and as ugly code as possible. Just get it working. 
So these are complete hacks sometimes, but sometimes they're really incredible research breakthroughs where they realize, you know, this model of doing fluid simulation is technically right if you have hours and hours per frame, but you can get 99% of the way there with this particular in optimization and this particular optimization. And those are research breakthroughs to be able to say, look, 99% of the way there for 1 1,000th the speed is a big deal. So that's a really big deal. And that's really cool. So motion capture we talked about a little bit before, but the difference in video games is you have to dynamically generate the motion of your creature or the thing you're, crea or you're creating in real time. So you might have a football player running straight ahead. And you might have a football player running straight ahead and making a right turn. But then the video game player, this young kid, goes forward and runs a slant, which is like a 45 degree turn. You don't have that in your video motion library. You have straight ahead and you have right turn. So what do you do? You cheat. You take the right turn and you turn the feet so the feet kind of slide. So the person's like, Turning to the right, but then you're sliding the feet, so by the time they're done turning, they only turned 45 degrees rather than 90 degrees. You see that? So you kind of cheat with the foot sliding to reuse motion libraries to make it look like whatever direction you want to go, the creature, the guy's doing the right thing. And if it's mostly straight ahead, it's mostly straight ahead. You just kind of cheat the leg, cheat the feet, so they're sliding and turning your creature as you're turning your character, turning your football player as you do that. Pretty cool. It's a lot of cheats. But motion libraries and motion synthesis, first of all, motion joining. Now they run straight ahead, and then they want to stop and join another motion, which is pre-recorded. But how do you make that seamless so it doesn't just go boom? And then all of a sudden, the, the arms and the rig set, the rig, goes pop as they do something else, right? Let's say I have a motion library catching a football, but I have no motion library running to catching. How do you have that smooth automatic interpolation from this motion in my hands to this motion in my hands? And there is some automatic interpolation that's used, but you have to be really careful not to have things pop. Just all of a sudden, run, run, boop. That just doesn't feel realistic. I move my hands too fast. So there is synthesis, which is making up new motions, as well as motion joining. And there's a lot of research at Berkeley to do the turns legally without, without changing the feet and doing some other things. How you can interpolate between the running straight ahead and the right angle with clever analysis of the motion library to be able to have a more generalized path. Pretty cool stuff. A lot of UC Berkeley research. If you're interested in that, James O'Brien and his crew of folks here at UC Berkeley are interested. Talk to them if you're interested. Artificial intelligence is a critical part of games. You have to have enemies, and enemies have to have intelligence. So there is kind of the very low level, which are simple heuristics. Just don't run into the wall and don't fall off the edge of the cliff. But there's also quite a bit of intelligence if you add on layers of sophistication of the AI. We'll talk a lot more about AI later in the semester. But you want to be able to have a real, you want to feel like you're playing against a real, a, another person, but in fact it's computer driven, but someone who's kind of be nuanced with you, which is someone who might grow in difficulty over time, a character which might, um, as you get better, get better with you, a character which is going to relate to your ability. So that character needs to, um, the AI involved in that is, is, Part of it is a learning one, which might learn what you do and react to it. That's true. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. You might, in racing games, they often cheat. I've seen racing games where if you're really far ahead, they always make it make it close and fun. If you're blowing past the person, what they do is they let the car behind go at like a million miles an hour. So, and they're behind like, wait, there's no way they could catch up to me. I was driving a Ferrari. They had a Ford with one wheel that was broken. <laughs> but how are they behind me still for after 10, 70 miles? Something's wrong here. So they do some cheating in that, and that's totally fine. Um, but here's a, here's a long-term pathfinding versus short-term steering idea. So short-term steering might say, okay, I'm looking not to, I'm, I'm a character, I'm going to be having this automated robot move forward, might be playing portal or something, and I, I don't want to run into a column. So at least don't hit a column in front of you. So that's just short-term steering. Plus, long-term planning, I need to get from where I am to around the corner down in the cafeteria because that's where my goal is. How do I get there fastest? And so there might be some path planning to find the fastest goal there. So the short term, don't hit the wall, and also long term, eventually point my downstairs to the cafeteria. Pretty cool stuff. Pretty sophisticated, pretty cool. Again, all has to happen in one thirty of a second. So really, you're trying to find the best AI you can get for the not much time you have per frame to make those decisions. One of your reading assignments was games with a purpose. And now we're talking about social implications and how can you have games make a difference. And that's why I think this is a really powerful piece of body of work that this researcher, Louis Vanan, has worked on. And I really support that. And I think it's great stuff. 
The idea is many people like to play games already, right? Most of you raised your hand when you say you like to play games and you want to learn about them. He said, why don't I take all those wasted cycles? I say wasted because he was thinking about the game, the world solitaire, where the whole world back in, you know, 2000s were just playing solitaire on those Windows 95 boxes, right? That's all they're doing, playing solitaire. And he calculated some kind of like a billion hours in a year that everyone in the world was playing solitaire. What if some fraction of that, of those hours, could be spent computing and doing real work that meant something to the world? And they were still having fun. So you're playing a game that as the result of playing the game, some work gets done that's as a benefit to society. Wouldn't that be amazing? And so that's what his project was about. And so he takes different takes on it. And so what he really is trying to attack is what problems are easy for humans, could be made fun for humans, but have an AI based or have some benefit. For example, the ESP game is a game in which two players are given, two random people are, are, are connected online. So I log in, and all of a sudden I'm paired with some other random player. I don't know who their name, who they are. And all I can do is I get an image and I type words. So I see an image, it's of a beach scene and there's a boat and there's a bird flying. So I might type beach, bird, sand, sky, bird. Okay? And I'm basically describing the image. And the moment the word that I say matches a word that my opponent says, bing, I get credit and I get a new image up. And I try to do as many of these images by having a match with what I'm thinking of and what the person's thinking of as fast as possible. And then as you proceed, you get badges and ranks and it, you know, you feel like, ooh, I'm doing, I'm already level lieutenant, lieutenant ESP player. And you, you know, it, it scratches that OCD rub, you know, that, that scratch that you have. It's, you know, scratching the little itch you got, the OCD itch. So part of it is, what's the, what's the benefit to society? Image labeling is useful. Why? I don't know. You go to a search engine, you type beach, and you click on images. And guess what? Here's a picture of a beach scene. How did it know? How did the system know it was a beach? Did some smart AI image processing person, uh, vision person say, oh, I calculate this frequency of blue and this pattern of sand quality and the degeneration of the... No. What happens <laughs> is the result of the ESP game was that that image has words associated with it. And now the reverse lookup is I now search for those words and guess what? I get those images. So image labeling is a hard thing for computers, but fun if you can make it a game. And he's looking at lots of things like that. So um, his most recent work is fascinating, is language translation. You're going to go and learn another language. And by learning it, you'll be looking at a word in this language, in the language you know, and you'll translate it into some other language you're trying to learn. And so you'll be working to learn, teach yourself, like a free version of, who's the, 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 who's the paid per, the, the paid language -y thing? <laughs> what, you, what you said. Uh, you all talked at once. But the, on, the, the pay version of this that you all know about, uh, it's the equivalent, a free version of that, right? It's the free version of a language learning. Now what happens as a result? Documents are being translated. Documents in Russian. If you look at English to Russian, documents in Russian, as a result of you playing this game and learning Russian, and Russian people learning English, are being translated. So now, all of a sudden, they're searchable and readable from an English language point of view. Isn't that wonderful? So it's the translation of the world's documents from their language to all the other languages done by people who benefit by learning a language. It's making the world a little smaller. Isn't that wonderful? He gave a talk at a conference, a CS Education talk, and other folks here were, and I stood up. I gave him a stand. I was, I was almost in tears. It was so powerful how we were going to change the world with this GWAP idea. So I'm totally behind him, and I want him to succeed like no one's business. Good stuff. So that's the good. That's the best thing that video games can offer. There's another best, which I don't mention, which is you can use games in learning, where you have a game where you're learning something and playing a game and learning that. Like You can make a driving simulator and learn to drive. Yeah, so there's learning in games as well. And you can do, make a game out of surgery where you know, people are using the robotic surgery and see how fast you can tie a knot. And then you can now use laparoscopic, uh, ultra, you know, laparoscopic uh, surgery remotely because you're really fast at the game of tying a knot. Therefore, when you're actually in surgery, you tie a knot faster, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, here's the bad, okay? So uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the bad is you play a lot and you're going to possibly suffer from RSI 
And I did myself. I was a Atari player in my day, is what they were in my day. I'm pretty old. And I would play, and my thumb would get frozen. I couldn't move it, and I couldn't, I couldn't use it. I had to like hold it like this. It was really crazy. And I would get play for five minutes, and it would get sore again. And I had to only, by not playing, let it go back, and now it's normal. But you can really have issues of that. Has anyone in the room had any issue of kind of wrist issues or thumb issues or body issues? Look at this. I'm catching about 10 people who have had those issues. From just video game use, I mean, not from anything else. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what I mean. So the solution is certainly break timers and rest and just don't do it. <laughs> it's like, doctor, it hurts when I do it like this. Doctor says, well, don't do this, right? Is that, <laughs> so it's a little bit of a joke. So the reality is don't do it as much, right? If you need to do it, just take breaks is the summary of it. But and also think of alternative interfaces. Sometimes, you know, having a Wii versus a hit the button. Maybe you can have something where the connect with me moving my body can have different, have, have health benefits of, you know, click, 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 click. And that can be good to my muscles and isometric exercises versus the thumb and hitting the thumb against a little thing. Also in bad is addiction. And I'm worried a little bit about addiction. People have seen, just like gambler addiction is real, video game addiction is real. And they've had players who have been diagnosed with this, and when they stop playing, they can't sleep, their hands are jittery, it's incredible. Um, I actually had a student who said, Dan, I failed your class, why, why didn't you come to class? Why did you miss my final? I had video game addiction, I couldn't stop playing this game. And they, they said, I said, you need to get help, and we called somebody, we got help for him. But I had a student who failed my class because of his self-described video game, he couldn't stop playing it. 48 hours, and didn't sleep, didn't sleep, and didn't, you know, it was bad, it was bad. There is an online Gamers Anonymous, so there is some support groups for that, and I want to encourage anybody who knows anybody to point them toward that, because that's real. Gamer's Wife is a name where, you know, I, I had a husband, but I guess I don't anymore because we got a PS3. And that kind of thing, where they're just, they're in the basement playing the video games all the time. So that's a real thing. Um, then there's the ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly, folks. The ugly is violence, and there was some reading about that that you had to, to explore. Um, there's been an attempted connection by a lot of folks who have tried to make a connection between Video game violence and real world violence. Um, they did find the Columbine killers like to play the shooting kind of games. And so is that just a correlation or is that a source, right? So that's why a lot of the research questioned that. Um, it's still, the jury is still out, to be honest, on that. Um, ratings do help in terms of giving parents some information about that. There's, there's a movement to make games the folk devil. The folk devil means you just blame some part of society for all the ills. Let's blame all the, you know, a lot of, a lot of countries in Europe having trouble with jobs. And so what are they blaming? They're blaming the immigrants who are trying to also get jobs and up to blame the immigrants. And let's now get xenophobic because it's the immigrants' fault that you're stealing all our jobs. Happens a lot in this country too. I, I warn you against that. But games are a folk devil in some sense, just blaming them for all the ills of society. Violence in the high schools, it's games. It might not be the fact that parents aren't doing the right thing or sending the kids to church or talking about their feelings or whatever. I don't know what it is, right? It could be other issues, but it's easy to just blame games for this problem if the kids play games and they're violent, and the kids are violent too. So now, that's it. I'm done with the good stuff. I, I'll give Glenn the most time he's ever had in any CS10 class to talk about his story. Hi, um, everybody. Um, so, uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I discovered computers when I was really young, when I was nine years old. Um, I grew up in Wyoming, so they were skiing in the winter, and... That was pretty much it. So I was lucky <laughs> that um, I was lucky that my father was one of his hobbies was electronics, and so he built some of the the first personal computers kits. Uh, they didn't sell them as machines yet, so he he built kits. Um, one of my favorite games when I was a kid was a Star Trek game uh, on a computer that uh, didn't have an uh, didn't have audio. The way that you played audio, uh, the game audio was put a radio up next to the computer, tune it to a station, and the interference from the microcontrollers inside the machine would cause the sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. Um, but um, health risks aside, I guess. Um, so, um, so I just started banging around with computers when I was a kid, and that's how I learned how to program. Um, a lot of the games that came out didn't have all this crazy copy protection and, and digital rights management software that it, that is out today that's that that is protecting a lot of the copy protecting or trying to copy protect games nowadays so I was able to tear them apart go through I guess my, this was well before modding came out uh, it became popular so I just used to tear games apart and then I started building them myself um, I spent a lot of time doing it uh, as a kid I got a D in my computer science class uh, in high school because I wrote a game while everybody else did a spreadsheet and, and typed one of their papers in Word.
Microsoft Word 0 0.8. <laughs> um, so yeah, so then, uh, so I got a little disenfranchised with school, so I just went right out into working. I knew I wanted to work in computers, and I knew video games was one of my, was one of my big goals. So along the way, uh, I worked at a company that did a lot of database work, so I learned a lot about data structures and a lot about moving large amounts of data around, which actually became very helpful later with network games. Um, I worked at a at a uh, aerospace uh, in industry, in the defense industry, doing machine learning and artificial intelligence research, and that was immediately applicable to video games. Although at the time, uh, computers weren't fast enough to handle having dedicated artificial intelligence that was really smart along with video games. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, so then, so I worked in a lot of different industries, and then, uh, I had, I was skydiving with a, a buddy of mine's girlfriend, and she said, oh, you should talk to my boyfriend because he does games. And I was thinking, well, yeah, okay, well, I, everybody says that they do video games, and everybody says they do computer games. And she said, have you ever heard of something called Where in the World is Carmen San Diego? And I was like... <laughs> And this was when it was, this was as it f had first come out, um, or just a few years after it had come out, and was hugely popular, and was made orders of magnitude more money than any other video game or educational software that was out there at the time. So I said, can I get his name and number, maybe? And, uh, and we t I, start, I called him up that night, and we talked for about four hours, reminiscing about old games on the Apple II computers and writing games in machine code, which is the, the no, right, just writing programs in numbers. Just 0, 1, A, 3, 0, um, and buildings, building the shapes, all the graphics and all the sound and everything was all done at a very, very low level. Machines um, at, through, the, through the years, um, stayed kind of trailed behind games. Games were always kind of at the, the vanguard, were always at the forefront of pushing technology to go faster and faster and faster. And nowadays, games are a large part of uh, hardware manufacturers and their design decisions. Whereas in the past, it was like, we've got to be business computers and we have to do spreadsheets and games, yeah, all that, that's great. But and now you see the market is huge. And that, the $25 billion is, that's the US market, right? And it's growing to $30 billion nowadays. So games now become much more important for hardware manufacturers too. So that opened up a world of possibilities. However, when I, then, when I started working with him and working with his new company, um, back then, the way that, that video games were, were made, almost all video games were made, was exactly what Dan had mentioned. You worked for a large publisher. That's how you did things. You had small development houses that concentrated on the core programming and the assets, doing, making the art, doing the audio, the music, all the design, the character and backstory. That's where I worked. I worked in a development um, software house called, called Presage Software. It was up in, in uh, San Rafael. And what you would do is either you would take an idea that somebody, somebody at a publisher had or an idea of your own that you generated and you would then detail it in a document called a tech spec and you would detail it to death. You would go through and try and figure out every single piece of art you were going to generate, every single piece of audio that you were going to generate, all the character backstories that you were going to do, and then all of the programming, the artificial intelligence, the audio drivers, the graphic drivers, it was intense. And you spent probably a good month before you even started writing a line of code or generating any art. It was all, it was all about coming up with a document and a budget that you could present to a, to a big name publisher and hopefully get funded. You would put in milestones, so every, say, couple of months, you would say, here's what I'm going to deliver to you. I'm going to deliver to you, you know, a skeleton, a working prototype. I'm going to deliver to you a game in beta form. Um, <clears throat> back then, beta really meant beta, not push it out to the public and then fix the bugs and then patch it online. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> that's a whole other thing. So, um, so that's what you did. And... 
what was really interesting at that time was was you had to go through and you had to you had to think ahead and you had to you had to decide you had to make design decisions that was based on not only the current hardware but where you thought the hardware trends were going in the future. So there were no 3D graphics cards when I first started developing games. So there were so very very few three dimensional games. When Doom came out, it was hugely revolutionary. It didn't require a video card, if you remember. It didn't require a dedicated three-dimensional video card, if you remember. Um, it was all done in software. It was all done on the microprocessor, and we'll talk about that on Friday in discussion. Um, you had to cheat a lot of stuff. My very first game that I did was a game for DOS. It had to run in 640K of memory, and we'll talk about that later, but that's orders of magnitude less memory than it's available even in my iPhone nowadays. Um, <laughs> It, they came out on floppy disks, and the manufacturers, the publishers, were really concerned about costs. So it had to fit on the least number of floppy disks as possible. So you had to do all kinds of tricks and jump through all kinds of hoops to get your game out there and developed. Um, budgets were in the range of a hundred thousand, maybe two hundred thousand dollars. That was a huge, big title back then. Two hundred thousand dollars was was an astronomically large figure that, that you could ask for from a publisher to design and develop your game. Now that's a drop in the bucket, as you've seen. Our credits list were could fit on a page. It was usually about 20 to 25 people per team per game. Nowadays, if you look, it's pages and pages and pages of credits. Um, you know, you have to have boatloads of artists. That's one really cool thing about now nowadays is that you can kind of you can start to specialize. In, in when I was developing games, you were when you were a programmer, you were you programmed everything. You did the graphics, you did the artificial intelligence, you did the audio drivers, you did the game design and level development, you wrote all the tools, you did everything. The artists would do package art, they would do logos, they would do sprites, they would do icons, they would do three-dimensional graphic uh, like the models, they would do all the texturing, they would do all the they would figure out the lighting. Um, so you, you had to be a very well-rounded individual, and, and those things overlap too. So you had to talk with the artists, you had to talk with the audio engineers, because you had to get things to fit into a certain size, and to still look good, and to still sound good. So there was constant communication back and forth. So one of the vital team members was always the producer, the game producer. And that, the game producer wasn't just the person who sat in their office and came up with cool ideas and then you know, handed it out. There was an email when I started either, so threw it out on, uh, you know, on pieces of paper and said, here, make my game. The producer was responsible for the communication and making sure that everything stayed under budget. And if you were going over budget, which happened nine times out of ten, um, because the, usually the publishers wanted more. They were like, okay, this is great, but you know what would be really cool? In which automatically the dollar signs would start ringing up. As soon as you started hearing, you know what would be cool, or it would be really great if, or you know what would, you know what would make this game really, really fun? you just immediately start thinking the dollar signs of how much time and, and energy was going to go into to modifying your game to, to get up to their spec or what they wanted. And you were all about what they wanted. Um, you tried to get as much of your design through as possible, but you had to, you constantly had to, it was just kind of this back and forth with the publisher who was thinking more on the business side and you were thinking more on the pure game you know, side. And I don't need to be spoiled with money and business and politics and blah, blah, blah. It just doesn't work like that. You you have to be involved with that, and you have to make that part of your of your design and your decisions. Um, so that was that was my model. My model was these big, it was these large monolithic companies. Then a huge revolution. There was always this this kind of homebrew game mentality that almost everybody in the game world worked on and or thought about. I started up my own development company. I had caught a couple guys from Blizzard, some artists from Blizzard. Um, we started up our own game development company, had an awesome technical team, had a great design, game design team, had a great uh, art team and, and audio team. The problem is, like I'd mentioned previously, there, that you, get, you have to think about the business. And we didn't put enough time and energy into thinking about the business pillar of the model. And we went to E3, we went to Game Developers Conference, we went to all these shows and all these game and the, all these conferences, met with all these publishers, pitched our designs, pitched our prototypes, um, got a lot of interest uh, and people ready to fund us, but then they looked at our business plans and looked at our business models and said, 
we don't think you guys are ready for this or mature enough as a company to work on these huge, you know, $200,000 titles. So that's a, and a really important part of game development that a lot of people don't think about. A lot of people think about, uh, you know, sitting down and coming up with cool levels and coming up with cool characters and things like that. That's a, that's a part of it, but, the, but the, the, the business model is also really important. But then a big revolution happened, and that's where you had games that could be done by two or three people and distributed over the, the net and, and distributed in stores like the App Store, iTunes, iTunes Store. Um, that was huge. Now, P, now groups of you know two to three people could design and develop their games and get it out there. It wasn't possible in the past. You had to reserve shelf space at at you know at one of the game get Game Depot or GameStop. Um, nowadays, people can do, can write their own games, which I wholeheartedly encourage you to do to try and see what it's like and go through the whole process and it looks awesome on your resume if you can come up with something that you can present to a per to a company and say I did this I designed this I followed all the way through it's it puts you right up at the top of the pile okay I'm done <laughs> have a good weekend we're a little late have a good weekend folks we'll see you on Monday Thank you.